Well, good evening and welcome back to another Life Lessons with Biblical Answer Bible Study. I'm Robbie Harmon and I'm here for the next little bit to talk with you tonight about the subject of baptism uh, and what it is biblically. And we'll be discussing that uh, through most of our uh, service tonight. I hope and uh, pray that you will continue to uh, join us each Sunday night. Uh, I know we've been having some off schedules and things like that. Uh, we've had a lot going on on our end as far as uh, sick and shut-ins and definitely with prayer services and things going on. We want to take care of the needs of as many people as we can and be able to encourage and strengthen each and every person uh, that needs that attention, that needs that love, that needs uh, the grace of Christ seen uh, in their lives. And I know how difficult it is when you've got so many people that can't get out. Uh, so many wonderful uh, elderly folks that are uh, suffering and going through so much and we want to be able to make sure that their needs are being met so uh, we were wanting to see about that this this evening with several folks and take care of those and also to meet the needs of several of our prayer request uh, recipients a couple things uh, if you are interested in sharing uh, your prayer request you're more than welcome to you can go to www.facebook.com slash brother robbie all one word slash brother robbie there and uh you'll go and uh, you'll see a little note on there say any prayer requests this week just go ahead feel free if you want to share that publicly we have a very dedicated group of prayer warriors that are serious about going through that and working with you and encouraging you praying with you and also praying for those needs uh, we are very serious about this. And it's not just, okay, we're going to pray for you and not pray for you. Our goal is to get the focus back on what is important in our churches, and that is that community, a community that builds, strengthens, and encourages through prayer, through meeting, through visitation, whatever the case is, whatever the need is, we want to be able to help that and build the body of Christ to be stronger through that dedication and uh, the willingness of the Spirit to be involved. So we want to do that. So if you have a public prayer request, you can leave that on there. If you don't have a public prayer request and you want to send that privately, you can always message me. I'd be glad to do that. Uh, if you are trying to catch up with the uh, Acts Bible Study, that's capable too. All you've got to type in is www.myllba.com slash YouTube. Okay? Myllba.com slash YouTube. That's all you got to do, and it'll take you right to my YouTube page and uh, everything you need to know about uh, what is going on in the book of Acts. There's, an, there's a, 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 there's a, a <clears throat> pardon me, uh, and uh, I'll get all my words out right here in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> there is an Ephesians Bible study on there as well. I about said Ecclesiastes. I've got my mind in the Old Testament tonight. I've been doing some studying. So, um, yeah, there's a, um, there is definitely that on there as well. So you can do an Ephesians Bible study on there as well. Uh, I believe that one is six parts. Also, this week we'll be introducing a brand new Bible study that's attached to that. We'll be introducing that on Wednesday night. Uh, Wednesday night around uh, 7 p.m. Central Time. If you're interested in watching that, it'll be here on uh, Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, it is about the armor of God. So we will be uh, premiering that on Wednesday night. So if you want to have some Bible study on Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Central Time, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, you're welcome to watch that and get involved in that. I know many of us are having problems with Wednesday nights not having service, but I know there are a couple of good congregations out there that are meeting, and I would encourage you uh, definitely to go. If you're in the Campbellsville area, the uh, uh, Southside Christian Church is meeting for Bible studies on Wednesday night. Uh, Brother Brian is in there, and uh, definitely a good folk, a good group of folk over there at the Southside Church. Uh, wonderful hearts, uh, definitely family to me, and uh, love every one of them over there. So, I uh, encourage you if you're in the Campbellsville area and you want a good Bible study on Wednesday night, that's where you go. So, uh, definitely do that. All right, let's get ready to get studying and uh, get into God's Word. Let's have us a look here. Okay, there we go. Hey, all right, things are clicking finally. Things are working right. All right. 
I say that with I say that with uh, abated breath because I know something could happen <laughs> at any point in any time. So uh, just keep praying for us. We're doing this a step at a time. Like I said, we want to be able to encourage everybody we can, and so we have a lighthearted approach here. We want to be able to invite you. We're you know, like I said, I'm just an average guy. I'm not some super scholarly guy that comes in and and shows his degrees and 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 shows how many books he's wrote and everything like that that has absolutely nothing to do with me it has everything to do with jesus christ that's what we're here for so i hope you'll listen and uh take what advice i can give um and and, and be able to study god's word that's what we're here to do we're here to be able to get into it and one of the questions i got asked this week uh when studying the scripture and it's a good question. I like this question a lot. What kind of Bible should I use when doing a Bible study? Now, a lot of folks will tell you all sorts of different things, and, and that's cool. Mine is strictly my opinion. It is not for me to tell you what type of Bible to use. If you want to use King James, if you want to use New King James, if you want to use New International, New American, if you want to use all those different versions, dot, 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 that's fine. But, as a guy who has some experience in helping people and encouraging people to study, one of the things I want to be able to do is try to make this as easy as possible for everybody from teenagers on up to be able to study God's Word effectively and to be able to grow into the study of God's Word. And what we do is we try to examine and see what types of Bible, what types of of uh, translations are best for us um, and definitely for younger folks for uh, new Christians for people that are uh, advanced in their study and want to know more and want to dig into the deeper parts of scripture there's all sorts of different things we can do and get into and let me just give you a little bit of uh, advice on this here's what I would recommend now for the teens and young adults, best for teens and young adults, I suggest the Holman Christian Standard, or HCSB, okay? Um, let me see, I've got one right here, real easy. Uh, you'll see right there. You'll, you'll see it, it'll look like that right there. That's what they've got on them, the HCSB. Uh, this is really good, I think, for young adults and young people alike. Um, it's very easy to understand, very easy to read. Um, it's not complicated, and, and it's not something that's going to be over anybody's head. So when you're going and reading scripture, say like, let's take, let's grab one right here. Let's go with Romans. There we go. Let's read Romans. Let's go with Romans. Flip over here. There we go. All right. Let's go with Romans 1. Let's go with Romans 1 here, verse uh, 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because the news of your faith is being reported in all the world. For God, whom I serve with my spirit in telling the good news about his Son, is my witness that I constantly mention you. Now see, it's very easy, very uh, flows very well. It is also a good balance between word for word, which is actually in the biblical Greek, and a, uh, a thought for thought, which means that it is more of a, this is what we think it means, uh, more along the lines of what the interpreter does. Uh, so it's a good balance between that to help you be able to understand and be able to study it uh, logically, based on what the scripture says, and to be able to do it and reason with it and have a devotional thought with it and allow yourself to grow into that. So with young Christians, uh, young, young teenagers and young adults, I highly suggest the Holman Christian Standard, very good version of the Bible. Uh, for new Christians, and this is what I'll be using for our Bible studies and what I have been using for our Bible studies, is the English Standard Version. The English Standard Version is very upfront. It is more word for word but it isn't so complicated that we have to go and try to pronounce words and, and do certain things like that. You, you can go and read it, and it's about a ninth grade level. So you're reading that, you know, most folks read it about um, a seventh, eighth, ninth grade level. Anyway, it's average, uh, average literature, average reading. It's very well put, very well designed to be able to be word for word and flowing. 
and uh, it is be able to be illustrated and young people who are growing into Christ that are just starting in Christianity that is that are new to the faith and want to know more and want to get into that word and just dig into the meat you know they get their milk they get their milk from that and then they go and they upgrade to their meat this is a very very good starter very good starter word uh, the best for seasoned Christians, and this is the one that I use a lot when I'm preaching and teaching um, in the pulpit and otherwise, uh, that would be the, well, this is kind of an old one. This is the New American Standard. This thing's been around forever uh, as far as mine has there. Uh, the New American Standard is one I highly recommend. It is for seasoned Christians. It is strictly word for word. It is very much a a looking at examining and seeing what the Greek word means and putting it to it and putting it into words that people can understand that is good it's effective so I hope I will encourage you to get in there uh, definitely like I said the New American Standard most of us have read the New American Standard at some point in time very beneficial when you're getting into God's Word. If you are a Christian that has been in God's Word for uh, several years, you know the King James Version. You've read through several other versions. You've got the New King James and everything. And sometimes when you go and you see the these and thous and everything, it gets a little complex. But the New American Standard puts that into a very contemporary English. But it also goes and puts it into a means by which it is closer to the original language. So it is word for word more than thought for thought now you may notice something there is a couple of bibles missing here the new international version per se now i know a lot of people use the new international the new international version it is good for devotional study however it does not give a solid word for word examination of scripture it is because unfortunately the way the niv is set up it is never going to be done. It's never going to be finished. It's not going to be, okay, well, it's like the King James version, you know, back in 1609 or anything like that. That's not that one specific version of that. You're reading a version that has changed and changed and changed some more and will continue changing as long as scholars change. And that makes it a little difficult. So what we suggest on that, use the NIV for devotional study. Use that for just in reaching and taking time out to pray reading through if you want to do a good thorough bible study it's probably not the best guide for you one other thing that, <laughs> that this sounds very contradictory but i want to explain myself a little bit study bibles can be helpful now everybody knows what a study bible is study bibles are those nice big bibles that you can get and, and and very you know they've got all sorts you got john MacArthur writing one you've got uh the schofield bible you've got this bible you've got that bible all these great big study bibles huge old study bibles that and and people look at those and say wow those are some those gotta be deep those gotta be good it's got all sorts of information in them yeah they can be good and yes they are chock full of wisdom they are but they can be helpful and they got they can be a little dangerous at times you've got to be careful you see the study bibles are scripture most part all of you know you've got word for word it depends on what you're getting if you get one that is a home and christian standard or an inner you know, english standard version or a new american standard you're going to get the bible however what you also are going to get are thoughts because down on the bottom part are man's interpretation of those verses and sometimes that can lend bias that can lead people to going and saying things that might not be scriptural at least based on what the entirety of scripture says you may say it if you take a verse out of context and say oh yeah this is what this means but it can be dangerous so what we encourage people to do instead of getting just some big thick study bible when you're starting out and going and, and and having to do all that and looking at what they're saying i suggest just grab your bible like this just grab you one just you see right there just verses and verses like that just like that no notes no nothing like that you just grab your bible and you read verse for verse what it's saying okay that way you don't have someone telling you in your ear what this is saying okay the first thing in bible study we are to do 
is leave bias at the door the best way we can. And that's hard for some of us to do, um, especially preachers. We have our own beliefs and what we're serving and what we're teaching and what we're preaching. But we have to stop and we have to realize we're human. Every single one of us are human. We will make errors. So what we need to do is we need to make as few errors as we can or else we may get called out on them. So let me just put this in here as well. Let's look at, let's, let's start our baptism study and then I'll also kind of cross this over with our, uh, this, this brief study on Bible interpretation. Um, Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I've got two very nice, show you these real quick these are two very nice very good apologetics bibles okay these bibles talk about study 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 they get into it in detail these guys dig into the word connect the word both of them do one is from a church of christ which is this one right here and one is from a more baptist uh, center point which is this one right here uh, it is produced by the folks over uh, I know that the uh, that many of the guys that helped get into this worked at Southern Theological Seminary so um, very good guys okay so you got this one here that's written by a group of Baptist scholars which are good guys and you got this written by a group of scholars from the Christian Church Church of Christ so also good guys so what's the problem well, let's have a look. This is in the Apologetics Study Bible. Okay, when you read Acts 2.38, there will be a little thing up here and it will say this to you. Many groups use the, these verses to teach that baptism is essential for salvation. Yet Paul made a distinction between the two when he wrote, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel in 1 Corinthians 1.17. He then described the gospel as, quote, the message of the cross, unquote, which is, quote, God's power to save, in verse 18. Baptism and the gospel are thus set in opposition to each other. Paul explained that the gospel is, the, is God's power for salvation, in Romans 1, 16. That's the apologetic study Bible. Now... That And as I said, that come from folks that had worked at Southern Theological Seminary. Now, I'm going to look at the Defending the Faith Study Bible, which is my Apologetics Press. Same thing here. Same verse. Acts 2.38. This verse teaches that baptism is the point at which a person contacts the blood of Christ and receives forgiveness of sins. In fact, these ver this, the verse explains that baptism was done in order to obtain that forgiveness. Some, however, have objected to the idea that baptism is necessary for forgiveness and salvation. The contention is made that the preposition for in the phrase for the forgiveness of sins means because of. They assert that the 3,000 people in this passage were baptized because their sins had been forgiven. You see what's happening here. Two different groups doing this okay first thing we need to do separate that okay so that is why i tell people stop using study bibles to go and do bible study now if you want to do a piece by piece study and use these as tools later on you're more than welcome to they'll give you insight they'll give you advice they'll help you but don't take them word for word that these guys they've got this stuff down here at the bottom that is not scripture. That is somebody's thoughts. That goes for Christian church, Church of Christ, Baptist church, Methodist church, Presbyterian church. I don't care what it comes out of. Don't take their words and say, okay, that's scripture. No, it's not. It's just a guy thinking and out loud, essentially. And these guys are smart. All of them are. I respect each and every one of them. But I also say, we need to be able to study God's word in its entirety and in detail. So we're going to do that a little bit tonight. So 
I want to go back to Acts 2.38, okay? So we're going to talk about baptism today, okay? We are going to study baptism. Here we are. We've gotten into 20 minutes of our study here, and we are going to be talking about baptism, okay? So let us get into here. Let's talk about this verse. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the first mention of baptism as a means to which a door to salvation, okay? Now, whether you believe that this is the point at which salvation comes or not, I want us to take a very close look that baptism is not something that is new, okay? Baptism is something that has been around for a very, very, very long time. And the principle of that is the cleansing power of the water. And it is not the water. It's like I said before. The water is not what saves you. Okay? And it's not the preacher. It's not the water. It's not you going under the water. It's not the physical. It's nothing like that. It is an appeal to God for a clean conscience. Okay? We'll talk about that in a minute too. But I want us to examine in detail how some of the Old Testament reflects the New Testament. And when we study the Bible, when we study baptism, one of the things you'll notice is Noah and the flood. The very first thing I think of when I think about baptism is Noah and the flood. Now, a lot of people look at me and go, what do you mean? <laughs> That's crazy. How in the world can the flood, which killed all these people, how can the flood even come close to reflecting what baptism is? How can that do that? And Genesis 6, 8, or Genesis 6 through 8, excuse me, Genesis chapter 6 through 8 deals with a lot of subject matter. I encourage you, while you're studying the book of Acts, go back and when you're doing these, these uh, special studies, go and read. Go and take time out to read Noah and the Flood. Talk about that. Read it. Examine it. And if you've got questions, ask them, you know, ask those questions. Uh, people ask me all the time, well, Robbie, you know that's just, you know, do you think that's uh, really, that really happened? Or do you think that that is just an allegory or anything like that? First off, let me say this, okay? I tend to be a kind of guy that I believe that God's Word is infallible, okay? When God's Word is there, God's Word means something, okay? Peter isn't going to go and cite Noah and the flood if it's just allegory. He's showing that this is a, an actual event that has happened in history. And I know there's a lot of people who look at that and go, hmm, ah, Robbie believes in the ark. You believe that? Yeah, I believe that. I believe that the ark is real. I believe that Noah's ark was real. Oh, we haven't found any proof of the ark. Well, it's wood, guys. You know, you could have built a house with it. You could have set fire with it. You could have done any number of different things with it. It was wood. It's going to happen. But, moreover, I want us to think about what the ark represented, okay? Noah was told by God to make an ark, okay? He was ordered by God to make a box that floated, essentially, a box that would float to save his family, okay? Save you and your family. You all get on, the, you get on that ark. You get in that box. You, you go and, and, and trust in me, and I'll take care of you. So what did Noah do? He built the ark. And I'm sure that there were people in that day. Here he was. He was working and laboring on this for hundreds and you know, for hundreds of years, 100 years, 125 years. And, you know, he's over here. He's building. He's building. He's using all sorts of gopher wood. You ever wonder why that area is, you know, we, we talk about the area of Lebanon and all, you know, and, and talk about the cedars of Lebanon and everything. And, well, it's, there's nothing there now. There's no trees there or anything like that. A lot of people like to think that. Well, you know, before... This is before the world was destroyed. This is before um, we have the deserts and before we have all this division and tearing up of the, of the globe, you know? Uh, so there were probably plenty of trees in Noah's area. So he did. He built this wooden box. And I'm sure there were people that were laughing at him, looking at him, saying, you're crazy. But the whole time that Noah was doing that, he was telling them, look, we got to get in here. If you don't believe us, you got a problem. You're going to end up dying. And Noah preached 
salvation, essentially. Get on the ark. And if you get in the ark, you will be saved. They didn't believe him. Well, the day came. Noah finished the ark. All the animals came aboard the ark. Noah and his family, eight of them all together, got on the ark, and God closed the door on the ark. The next thing you know, the fountains of the deep explode. And all of a sudden, the earth is covered in water. Not for 40 days. It said it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Geshem rain, as a matter of fact, as the word is. Geshem means a hurricane-type water, or hurricane-type uh, rain. It was constant. It was driving. It was raging. And it was just in torrents for days and days and days on end. And it took months, months for it to settle. Then it says God remembered Noah and his family and remembered the promise that he had made to save them. And so there they went on the mountains of Ararat. Landed right there. Got off of the ark. Got in, gave thanks to God, sacrifice, job well done. So what happened there? Now a lot of people would look at me and say, now how in the world does that have to do with baptism? Let's turn to 1 Peter 3.21. Actually, let's start a little bit before that. In 1 Peter 3.18, as a matter of fact. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey. And when God's patient waned in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were bought safely through water. Look at the next verse and put that in with what we just read. Let's read this all together here. Okay? In the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Look at that. It connects. Just as God made his promise to Noah, if you go and you build this ark, if you create this ark, as I have instructed, you go and have direct in the proper measurements, the proper materials. You put this here, you do that there, and you seal this bad boy up inside now. And you get on this, and you and whoever gets on this is going to get through that water and be saved. That was his promise to Noah. It's his promise through baptism as well. Because it is corresponding to this, as Peter has said here, corresponding to this now baptism saves you not the removal of dirt not that physical water not anything that is physical this is a spiritual event because it says right here it is an appeal to God for a good conscience it is going to God and allowing God to do the work within you because you can't do it I can't do it Nobody can get you to heaven that's here now. But you can go and you can submit to God. You can give God his authority and say, Lord, you can do this. I trust you to do this. And I'm going to let you do this because I need this. I can't do this on my own. Please, Lord, heal me. And he'll heal you. He will give you new life. Now, another place where we see baptism in the Old Testament is Solomon's temple. <laughs> a lot of people look at me and go, what? How in the world can the temple show that? Well, there's a couple of things you might notice about the temple, of course. If you go inside and you do a really good study of the temple, you'll find that uh, there was a table of showbread in there and it, that that was representative of 
a, a sacrifice. Uh, yeah, you took from the table of showbread if you were a priest, and that represents a lot like the Lord's Supper that we partake of today. Uh, that there were many menorah in there that lit the way, that God's word is symbolic of that, that it is a menorah, it is a light unto our feet and a light unto our path. Uh, there are all sorts of things that can grow and help us to understand more about it. But what we have to be willing to do is we have to be willing to examine and study and get into that. Now, there is one other little thing that was at the temple. One other little thing. This. <laughs> this great big bathtub. <laughs> and people look at me and go, what are you calling it a bathtub for? It's not a bathtub, okay? It's not a bathtub. This is actually a cleansing pool, okay? This is a place where the priests came. And before they entered the temple, before they entered into the area, the commons, where they were going to give sacrifice, where they were going to give uh, uh, burnt offerings to God, they had to completely disrobe and they had to get into that tub. And they had to cleanse themselves. They had to ritually cleanse themselves. They had to go and clean themselves off. They had to immerse themselves. Because going before God as who they were was not right. Okay, now a lot of people look at me and go, oh, now you're saying that baptism is legalistic. No, it's not. It's reflective of that. God's always been about being, a, being one who seeks obedience. It isn't the water that is going to clean them. Okay, you can't wash sin off. It won't come off. However, God asks and says, do this. Priests, I want you to go and I want you to wash yourselves. Okay, before you enter into the Holy of Holies, when you come into my area, when you come into who I am, and you come into my presence, I want you to wash yourselves. I want you to be thorough, and I want you to wash yourselves. Now, what would that mean to us? How in the world could that be reflective? I mean, that was the priests, right? We're not priests. Are we? <laughs> but you... You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Look at that. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. Same book that we got the illustration of Noah and baptism being interlinked. You are a royal priesthood. You're set apart for a holy purpose. You've been cleansed. Where does that start? With obedience to God. With obedience to God and by being able to go and say, I want to be a follower of Christ, so I'm going to allow God to do the work in me. I submit to God's will. And that can be corresponding right here to Titus 3, 4 through 7. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness. See, baptism, the work in and of itself, can't do that, but God can. We don't do the baptism work. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God takes care of us. He washes us. He cleanses us. But it is through his power that he does this. Like I said, we'll be talking about that a lot more here in a minute. Because... We have to be willing to be priests. We have to submit ourselves. Now, does that mean we're saved by law? Absolutely not. We're not. We're not saved by law. We're saved by grace. Jesus died upon the cross for us. He didn't have to do that. Jesus did not have to die for us. He could have stayed in heaven and said, no, you know what? You guys are on your own. But he didn't do that. You see, as I said this morning in our um, uh, sermon, and, and Jesus... Our Lord is the only God 
in all of the world. When you study world religions, he is the only one who has been able to show he loves his followers. He is the only one that cares so much for them that he is willing to die for them. Most of the time, the gods are expecting us to die for them. But it is Jesus who dies for us. And we should be humbled and thankful for that. We are blessedly rich. We are, we, we are rich, richly blessed. Excuse me, I'll get my words <laughs> taken care of there. We are richly blessed when we allow God to do what we need Him in us to do. When we allow Him to come in. When we allow His Spirit to do the work. When, because, you know, you hear me say, when we do that. The problem is, so many of us are so thinking that we have got this. We've got it all together. We can take care of ourselves. We can do anything. And that is why God wanted to prove one more Old Testament reason why he does the work in us and we don't. We think we've got it. We think if we do some great work, we're going to be fine. We think if we go and give money to the poor kids and to the widows, we're going to be fine. If we go and, and, and work a couple hours at a homeless shelter a week, we'll be good because we're good people. That's not going to get you to heaven. What is going to get you to heaven is Jesus Christ. And only through the name of Jesus Christ, only through obeying Jesus Christ, can you get into heaven. Only following him will get you there. He that, follow, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Jesus' own words in Mark 16, 16. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. It's Jesus' own words. We can't deny those. And so I want to bring up the last Old Testament reflection. And we talked about him a few weeks ago. If you were here for the uh, prelude to Acts, which I'll include up in the corner up here, okay? I'll include every little eye on our YouTube page. If you're studying this, if you watch this on YouTube, there we go, a little eye up in the top corner there, and it'll say on there, go ahead, click on this, and you'll see the lesson on the prelude to Acts, and we'll be talking about Second Kings. And I want to talk about good old Naaman for a minute. Naaman is a proof positive example of God being at work. God being at work as he was in the day of Pentecost on that day when 3,000 souls came to know him. I want us to look at what Naaman went through. Elijah sent a messenger to him say, Go and wash in the river in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. Naaman got angry. Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought he would surely come up to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the rivers and all the waters of Israel? Can I not wash in them and be clean. I can do it my way. How many times have we said that? I don't need God. I can do this on my own. How many times have people said, well, I don't have to listen to what you say. I know what the Bible says, and I say it's this way. Stop it. Look at what God's Word says. Don't fight God. Listen to him. Listen to what God says. Naaman has received a message from God, directly from Elisha. Elisha says, this is how it is to be done. If you want to be healed, this is how you do it. Go wash yourself in the Jordan River seven times. Naaman doesn't like that. Well, surely he would have come out here and healed me. He'd, touch it, he'd put his hand over the spot and I'd be healed. Surely that I would have the Holy Spirit descend on me from above and I would be saved. Just like Cornelius. How many times have y'all been told that? 
that in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius received the gift of the Holy Spirit. That meant that he was saved before he was baptized. How many times have you all been told that? Is that why the Holy Spirit descended on them? Nope. Keep studying the book of Acts with me. We'll get there. I want you to do that, though, if you'd like to. Study Acts chapter 10. Take time out and study Acts chapter 10. And I want you to look at what Peter says to the people that were behind him. Yes, there were other people there beside Cornelius and his family. Look at what he tells those guys. And put to task what you've been taught. Look at what the Scripture says. Don't listen to me. Look at what the Scripture says. I can't emphasize that enough. Look at what God's Word says here. Poor old Naaman was upset. He was angry. <sighs> can't believe he would do this to me. Tell me I got to wash in that old muddy Jordan River. Ain't all the rivers over here in Jordan, ain't there better places in all of Damascus to go and get a bath? So much cleaner, so much better. But his servants came near to him and said, Father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. If it was not that, you know, it is a great word that was spoken to the prophet, or spoken, if, 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 excuse me, let me get this right here. My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Will you not do it? This is a great thing. Do you realize this? He's telling you to go jump in a river and immerse yourself seven times. Go dip your head underwater seven times and you will be healed. Has he not actually said to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. Look what happened. They brought it up. They said, man, this is something great. Do you realize he's not telling you to go climb the highest mountain? He ain't telling you to swim the longest ocean. He's telling you to go and dip your head underwater seven times in the Jordan River. That's it. That's all. Nothing else. Wash and be clean. And so he went down to the Jordan according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a new child, and he was clean. I can't emphasize this enough. I would underline this, highlight this, however you want to do. You can put this as a promise of God right here. This is true in the Old Testament and the New. The New? Uh-huh. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. The same way God raised Jesus from the dead, he's raising you from the dead. You see, everybody likes to think that baptism is the first sign that a new Christian is going to be doing what's right. That's out of order. You see, baptism is not the first act of a Christian. Baptism is the last act of a dying sinner. Someone told me that years ago, and I've held that close to my heart ever since. It is the last act of a dying sinner. And I know that because it is through the belief and trust in God that we are saved. And that means we have to be willing to believe, repent, confess it, that Jesus is Lord and be baptized. That's biblical baptism. If you go up and dip yourself in water, I can go and dip myself in water 100,000 times. And if I don't believe in God... I'm just going to be a wet, dirty sinner, you know. I'm still going to be the same guy. But it is only when we trust in God, when we appeal to God for a clean conscience, as 1 Peter 3.21 says, when we go and do as, as Colossians 2.12 says here, to be baptized and allow Him to raise us up through faith in the powerful working of God. That, that is when we're saved. 
That's the moment. We trust in God. And I'm not here to talk semantics. I'm not here to argue. I'm not here to fuss. I'm not here to tell you you're wrong and you're going to hell. I'm just telling you what I read and what I see in Scripture. And I hope you'll study with me too. I hope you'll dig into what the Scripture says and get into God's Word and dig in deep and see where all these words connect in together and all these ideas. And it brings me back to the apologetics study Bible. For Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel. He described the gospel as the message of the cross which is God's power to save. Baptism and the gospel are thus set in opposition to each other. That's wrong. And that's one of the problems in this piece of scripture. Or not in this piece of scripture, excuse me. <laughs> See, you can get confused sometimes, can't you? This is a man's thought. A scholar's thought. I mean, it's good words. It's solid study. I mean, these guys dig into this stuff. But there's one problem. He uses 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 18. Well, I want to do something else. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 18. It's not about baptism. You know, he says, oh, well, baptism and baptism is something Paul did not want. He didn't want baptism. He wanted to be able to preach the word and save people. He didn't, you know, salvation and baptism are two totally different things. Are they? Let's read the whole section. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there is no division among you but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has come to my, it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow, a, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? What Paul, was Paul, excuse me, was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize the household of Savanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. This isn't about baptism. This is about division. Paul's glad that people weren't being baptized in his name because there were a whole bunch of people that were going, well, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. I've been baptized by Paul. I was baptized by Apollos. I was baptized by Paul, uh, Peter. Let me tell you something. Sound familiar? It reminds me a lot of when I talk to people. Well, where do you, you know, what congregation are you a part of? Well, I'm a part of the Baptist church. I'm a part of the Methodist church. I'm part of the Presbyterian church. I'm part of this. I'm part of that. Has Christ been divided? I don't care what building you're a part of. I don't care what denomination you're a part of. I don't care about that. I want to know that you go into heaven and that you believe in Jesus Christ. Are you a Christian? And if you believe in Christ, you will follow Christ. You'll even notice in there, I was baptized by Christ. I follow Christ. Well, obviously. Maybe they were there when John the Baptist was around and followed Christ right afterward and said, Yes, sir, I knew Jesus firsthand. Arrogance. Pride. My mom, not my mama, but I know people. Not my mama, but I know because my mama was a Methodist at one time. She believed in the Methodist faith. But there are people that will go and say, I was raised a Baptist and I'll die a Baptist. Is that what Scripture says to do? It says to be a Christian. It don't say to be called a Baptist. It don't say to be called Methodist. It doesn't say to be called Catholic. It doesn't say to be anything like that. Start living for Christ. Drop the names. Drop the division. 
See? It's where study Bibles can get you sometimes. But there's one other little problem with what was said here. Baptism and the gospel are thus set in opposition to each other. Paul explained that the gospel is God's power for salvation in Romans 1.16. Yeah. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. No. Paul did not divide that out. He didn't push them one over here and one over here. In fact, Paul said very much so. They are interconnected. Very much so. In fact, when we get into more of Acts and when Paul is going and testifying and telling of his, uh, of his baptism and his experience with being saved, he says, why do you delay? Be baptized now. Paul's not going to change his mind in a couple years. He's not going to go and, and, and tell you, no, no, you ain't got to be baptized. He's saying it right here. And then there's one other thing. The same book where Romans 1, 17 is, Romans 6, 1 through 5. What shall we say then? Are we continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin now live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him in, by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. The working of God. For if we have been united with him in his death, like his, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Are you seeing it? Are you connecting the dots? This isn't something that I try to say, well, see, I know better than you. I don't. I ask you to pray about this and study it. Get into it. Dig into God's Word for a moment. See what God's Word says. And live what God's Word says. Don't take an old man's opinion on it. Don't take my examination and observations. Take His. Take God's Word. Take God at His Word. Baptism, biblical baptism, is something more than dipping yourself in water. It is immersing yourself in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is meeting Christ at His weakest and at His greatest. When Christ died on the cross for us, He yielded Himself completely so that our sins may be absolved. As we go and we give our lives to Christ, we are buried in baptism, dying to our sin, and living a new life just as Christ was resurrected by God through God's hand, through God's work. So too, we are raised up in the newness of life. If we can be united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. I hope that this baptism study has been encouraging. I hope it's been insightful and enlightening. Okay? I realize that this is presented in a way that many Christians, many evangelical Christians may not agree with. My job is not to go and convey the belief system of a group of people. It is to look at God's Word, examine God's Word, and preach God's Word. That's what my duty is. It is not just my duty. 
It is my absolute pleasure and desire to be as examining and truthful with what God's Word says as it can possibly be. And I hope that you will study God's Word closer. Get involved with it. Get in a relationship with Christ. Dig into His Word. See what the Scripture says. Don't go by your own biases. Drop them at the door and look at God's Word in a new light. It's the least we can do for a Savior who gave His all for us.